Hey there, Wasteland Warriors, it's your buddy Ty, and we're back at it again for another adventure. This time, it's the year 2258. Future. America and China keep edging each other, till they eventually come to an explosive climax. You, the protagonist, falls out of your mother and meets Liam Neeson. But unfortunately, he goes out to get milk. Bye, son. Doubtful you'll see him again, you venture to Detroit, meeting the locals and learning how to survive the wasteland, where enslaving a person in pure daylight is A-OK, -okay, but you steal someone's soda, that shit causes a statewide manhunt. Interact with friendly local wildlife. And remember to always check your corners. Intoxicate and have a pleasant Sunday afternoon barbecue. Something smells like bad karma. Meet the Great Deku Tree. Glad to see you're finally awake. Kill the Great Deku Tree. In this totally fully optimized title, just thank God it no longer needs games for Windows Live. Welcome to Fallout 3. Yes, free. I, I know you didn't play 1 and 2. Don't worry about it. None of us did. Fallout 3, oh boy, I love this game back in the day. When people talk positive about Bethesda, which, let's be honest, doesn't happen very often nowadays. If it's not Elder Scrolls being discussed, it's the Fallout series, originally developed by Black Isle Studios, who made Fallout 1 and 2 as a turn-based combat game with a top-down view, which was pretty successful It had a cult following. Bethesda decided to bring the series into the current era of games as an RPG FPS title, just like Oblivion and Morrowind. Honestly, this was a massive W for Bethesda, because it turned out to be a massive success. But over the last few years, people have gone from loving Fallout 3 to actually hating it in comparison to the newer games like Fallout New Vegas and even Fallout 4, which, wait, didn't we hate this one? Regardless, I remember playing through this game multiple times back in the day and even 100% in it, back when I was a little tie on my Xbox 360. Though, to be honest, most of those hundreds of hours of game time was sitting on the loading screens. But with the new Fallout TV show on the horizon, or likely out by the time I release this video, I don't know, I'm bad at my job, sorry. <laughs> I thought it might be high time to venture back into the wasteland and see if this title was as amazing as I remember or if I've spent most of my adult life blinded by my nostalgia tinted goggles. Also, there's one more thing. If at any point during this video, you think, hey, you know what? This Thai guy is actually not that cringe. Well, first off, you're fucking wrong. And second, you could do me a massive solid. If you haven't already, please hit the like and subscribe button. You know the drill, it greatly supports a video and channel. And as I haven't done a Fallout video on the channel before, it would really let me know that you guys are interested in more. So if I get quite a few likes, I know you guys would like to see a Fallout New Vegas video next. And then maybe a Fallout 4 video after that. So if you're a fan of those games, you know what to do. But anyway, without further ado, let's dive in and see if Fallout 3 was really that good. Fallout 3 was set in a futuristic Washington, D.C. in the year 2258, but things look a little less D.C. and a little more Detroit. You see, in 2077, America and China had a little nuke measuring contest that got a little out of hand. China decided to drop the first nuke and Uncle Sam doesn't hesitate to clap back with their own, <coughs> seemingly glassing the entire planet. Thankfully for a select few people, America was preparing for this, and made these bunkers called vaults across the country to wait out the nuke attacks. Awesome, you might think. I got a cute little vault boy on there. Like, what's the worst that can happen? Well, what seemed like safe havens turned out to be a way for Vault Tech Industries, the company that made these vaults, to run experiments on the poor suckers seeking shelter from this nuclear war. So, after China achieved that 25 kill streak and the dust settles, most of the world becomes the wasteland, insanely irradiated and crawling with the worst people and the freakiest of freaks of nature you could imagine. You actually start the game at your own birth. Wow, just like in real life. But after picking a name and creating my character, we get told by this machine that I'll be ugly by the time I reach 30. Wow, just like in real life. Unfortunately, our mother doesn't survive the birthing process. Fast forward a entire year, and we are a cute ass baby living with our dad, Liam Neeson. Yeah, it's actually him. I'm really surprised they got him to voice our dad. 
There you go. My goodness, just a year old and already walking like a pro. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. We're living at large in Vault 101. We do some parkour, we rugrats our way out of the pen, and our dad pushes religion onto us. Revelation 21.6 I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He always loved that. Wow, gee, I wonder if this will come into play later on, hmm? We fast forward nine more years and it's our 10th birthday party where we receive our first Pip-Boy. We head down to the basement and meet Jonas who gives us a BB gun and Liam Neeson apparently likes to watch, I guess? Are you ready for your surprise? Are you ready for your surprise? As we practice shooting our BB gun. Anyway, Jonas is a cool second dad and we white out again. Six years later, we are heading to do our GOAT exam, which is an exam to determine what our role in the vault will be when we grow up. But not before being a Reddit white knight and saving a martyr from the bullies was such a nice guy. Also, shout out to this Chad teacher that just lets me skip the test because, I don't know, maybe he's a big fan of Taken. Listen, I like your dad. I might even like you if I wasn't your teacher. So here's what I'm going to do. If you want to skip the test, just tell me how you want it to come out, and I'll take care of it for you. We decide which stats get a head start, and then we white out again. You know, this is becoming a bit too frequent. I might need to get my head examined. <laughs> Amata quickly wakes us up and tells us our dad has left for milk, which is strange, because we already have some in the fridge, but because he's left the vault, the overseer is pissed and killed Jonas, and apparently now coming for us. Thanks to Amar, we quickly escape, but we do see the Overseer essentially torturing his own daughter to get more information on us. He's my friend. I was worried about him. What does he have to do with any of this anyway? One more time. You need to learn some respect. Please, Daddy, no! I don't know if it was just standing there watching the abuse of a dear friend, or the obvious head trauma I've been suffering with since my birth, but I might have taken things a little bit too far this time. Ah, sorry, Amada. We get out of the vault and get our opening vista that Bethesda always nails on the head, if you've not got any DLC installed. Really hate the DLC notification, by the way, guys. This popping up ruins the moment so bad, and you do it in every title. Like, wh why? Just do it a little bit later, please. So we're in the wasteland. We have no idea what to do, where our father is, and we don't have no way markers, no hints, no nothing. I think it's the perfect time to discuss some of the mechanics in this game. Now that we've left Vault Tutorial. Wait, is that why it's called Vault 101? Because it's a tutorial? I did, how did I not know this? Anyway, the gameplay. The gameplay is basically your standard first person shooter thrown into a blender. Like, holy shit, this game is clunky. <laughs> I feel like the reason for this is because the engine is primarily made for melee and hand-to-hand -hand combat, like in the games Oblivion and Morrowind. To counteract that, Fallout 3 uses a system called VATS. This essentially pauses the fight and allows you to pick a certain body part, and the game will do some mathematics on your stats and how you respect your character to see if you would make those shots. Very akin to games like XCOM. This is a pretty cool system, I like rolling the dice to see if I can make some shots. What I don't like is the freehand shooting. Now, back on the Xbox 360 with a controller, this wasn't so bad because, I mean, playing first-person games on a controller is clunky anyway. So you'd go out of your way to use VATS to avoid that. Playing on a mouse and keyboard, you have far more accuracy on your shots. So when the game is telling you that this is missing and you have a hundred small guns, it doesn't feel good, man. This is scammy. <laughs> but not only can you shoot different body parts for enemies, they have weak points that you need to focus on in gunfire. So you have to know your enemy, as well as if they pull out a grenade. Like, I mean, why shoot them in the head when you can just pop the grenade and take them out that way? For its time, this was a really cool system, coupled by an insane amount of guns that you can play with, from energy to marksman to explosive, even melee combat. There's so much freedom here, I absolutely love it. And speaking of freedom, I guess we should talk about the karma system. So here's the deal, in the wasteland, you are a blank canvas. 
And to be honest, I didn't really have a plan on how I was going to go about my playthrough this time around. At first, I aimed to be a good guy, you know, helping folks like Amada out, standing up to the bullies, always choosing a more noble dialogue option when it popped up, and I even went as far as helping Butch when I escaped the vault. I tried to avoid unnecessary bloodshed during my escape, but when I saw the overseer torturing Amada, let's just say my inner judge and jury kicked in. And there was a few moments like that when I tried to be the bigger person walking away from a conflict, but all it really took was a passing word or a snide comment and... Good riddance, get out! Go ahead! I realized I'm not the bigger man. And sorry, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, but it wasn't until I found myself agreeing to help a dude wipe out an entire town and then proceed to exterminate a group of ghouls because the snooty rich people I'm now chilling with, I guess, didn't like the way they looked. I then started receiving gifts from slavers who heard tales of my exploits. Like when a slaver comes up to you and gives you a gift, you know you're doing something wrong, right? The final straw, I guess, when I realized that I wasn't quite a good karma person was when I had my own personal slave. <laughs> Maybe we're the bad guys. Now, the karma system in Fallout is pretty bare bones other than that. Most of it doesn't really come into play unless you're trying to recruit a specific companion or the ending slideshow. Most of the time, you can do everything in the game. And I know a lot of people don't like this system and are actually kind of happy that it's not in future titles. I am the complete opposite. I love this system. I love being able to make my character evil for the sake of just wanting an evil character. This is an RPG. Games like this came from D&D where you could literally make your character whatever you wanted it to be. Yeah, the system might be flawed, but I don't think it needed to be taken out. But speaking of karma, I'll tell you who doesn't give a shit where you are on the scale. Dogmeat. The best companion in the game by far. He is the goodest. Boy. Before heading to Megaton, I would highly recommend detouring to the scrapyard, where I would say you save Dogmeat for some bandits, but he doesn't need saving. He gets one whiff of the Lone Wanderer and he's like, you know what? This could be fun. And that's it. He's the best companion in the game. He can go find you some loot or ammo. And I think he has the most health in the game because like he just doesn't die. And the best part about him is that he doesn't take up a companion slot, so you can have him and another NPC joining you on your adventure. So we have our own personal Hellhound, well, with nothing else to do, we head to Megaton, a settlement that's built around a nuke that didn't explode on contact. It's alright, little buddy. It happens to most nuclear warheads. It's completely natural. Fallout really likes to have like a theme and gimmick for their settlements, which usually is fine and can be pretty interesting. I'm gonna be honest, this one's a bit dumb. Come on, after a nuclear war almost wipes out the whole of civilization, you wouldn't exactly want one on your doorstep, right? It's like buying a house in Birmingham and having a kitchen knife store across the road. It's just too foreboding. Anyway, walking around town, we meet Moira Brown, who, hey, I know you from the internet. She actually offers what I consider the best side quest in the game, especially this early on. You see, this is kind of like more tutorial rolled into your first side quest. You're tasked with creating the Wasteland Survival Guide, which is great because we kind of need to learn about how to survive in the wasteland. She'll have you go into different locations to loot on medical supplies or ammo, maybe trying to find your way through a mine-ridden city. To even how to deal with radiation and broken limbs. These side quests are cool because there's two stages to them. You could do the bare bones and just complete the quest, getting some caps and some experience. Or you can go above and beyond and tend to get like special perks and weapons and gear that you might not find normally. For instance, the armored vault gear you get at the start of this quest is kind of a mainstay in the series. It's iconic and most people use it throughout most of their playthrough. So 100% worth trying this out. And if you need a reason to go explore, she has you going across the wasteland quite a bit. You travel all over DC for this quest. All right, the side content's pretty cool, but we're back on track and finding our daddy. Heading to the saloon, we encounter Colin Morari, who actually knows about our dad and where he went, but won't tell us unless we give him some caps. To be honest, after doing the side quest with Moira, I'm pretty stacked, so it's not much of an ask. We give him a few caps and he tells us that he was heading over to Galaxy News Radio, as if anyone in the wasteland knows what's going on, it's whoever runs that station. Alright, cool, we have a plan now. We say our heartfelt goodbye to Megaton. Each of us. 
and give birth to a billion stars. Oh, and don't worry, if you haven't finished Moira's questline, she's the only survivor. Jeez, um, let's find a bit of moisturizer will buff that right out. Thankfully, before I decided to put Megaton in the recycle bin, it turned out my karma was bad enough for me to hire Jericho as a companion. I personally didn't think I was that bad before I blew up Megaton, but I guess I was. As we start to make our way to DC towards Galaxy News Radio, I decided to do a little bit of exploring and ended up meeting this cool guy, Dukov. This cool guy whose lifestyle is just drinking, banging, and drinking. A lot of drinking, Jesus Christ. This man knows how to live the wasteland lifestyle, though I don't know what's going on with his hands. What are those? I'm starting to see why these girls hang around here so much. Apparently, it's not all sunshine and finger banging. <laughs> For fuck's sake. As Clover wants to get the hell out of here, so we're going to help her out. Super conveniently... Dukov apparently loses his vision or something. Uh <laughs> Yeah. The sooner we the break my bed springs some. Have you seen Cherry? I think the bitch ran out on me. Yeah, Dukov, she's right there. <laughs> you okay, bro? So we free her from Dukov's place and though I'm playing a bad guy, I feel like I've done my bit for society for the day. We head back on the trail for Dad and we bump into some Brotherhood of Steel members and we get to Galaxy News Radio in DC. But before we can enter, we fight this beefed up super mutant that straight up just kills Jericho. Holy shit. Man, this guy is stacked. He should be on physical 100. Unfortunately, there is no dad here either, but Free Dog does tell us where he went after we help him set up a new radio broadcast dish, which does now allow us to listen to his fantastic radio station. The songs in this game are amazing. Unfortunately, YouTube is already frothing in the mouth to copyright strike me for playing this game, so I can't play the music. But you can find playlists on YouTube that have all the songs in the game, and I would highly recommend it. They are awesome, especially if you like the word nuclear repeated constantly. Free Dog tells us to head to Rivet Sea, which is an old warboat aircraft carrier turned into a settlement. We head over there and meet Dr. Lee, an old friend of our dad's who, you guessed it, tells us our dad is in another castle. Jesus Christ. Okay, this bait and switch stuff has gotten real old real fast. We do find out that he might be at Vault 112, as the overseer of that vault might actually have something to help our dad reopen a project that he used to do called Project Purity. All right, I'll go check it out, but I swear to God, if he's not there, I'm nuking another settlement. I'm looking at you, Rivet City. Speaking of bad karma choices, on my journey to Vault 112, we stopped by a little place called Paradise Falls, a quaint little settlement completely ran by slavers. Okay, this is going to be interesting. The people at this place are very quick to hire me on as one of their top traders? I mean, I'm not going to lie, I went and did this quest because, I mean, it's an open quest, what do you expect me to do? Once we gain a bit of volunteer work, we head into the camp and meet Yuriji. He's a pretty chill guy in a pretty sweet suit, not going to lie. I think that's in my size too, got to remember that. We can actually buy a companion here, though the word companion is probably not correct. <laughs> Here's where you get Clover. My name's Clover. I hear you're the new man in my life. You're looking for a bodyguard, and I'm looking for a body. You're always welcome to take whatever you want, lover. She is my favorite companion, but also, what the fuck? She's my favorite companion. <laughs> What's wrong with me? It was at this point I kind of realized I'm like Nazi Germany levels of bad this playthrough. Apparently, Clover will be in love with whoever holds her leash, which I guess means just her slave detonation collar, which will apparently blow if she doesn't. Even walking around this place gives me bad vibes. Like, if you have bad karma, slavers will run up to you and give you gifts. Hey, we grabbed this on our last... It's at that point you kind of realize, maybe I'm doing things wrong. 
<laughs> but we have our new companion, so it's time to get back on track and head to vault 112. Finding the secret entrance to the vault, we see that the vault's experiment was actually virtual reality and honestly, give Apple a few more years, this could be a reality. But wait a minute, is that... FATHER! After all the bait and switching going on in this game, it was really good to see Daddy Dearest here, but he's trapped in the simulation, so we have to go full Matrix and plug ourselves in. I love this section. Tranquility Lane is so funny. I love it when a developer can just be wacky and have fun with a part of their game. And this to me is what Tranquility Lane is. They just kind of went a bit wild. So it turns out Braun is living out his fantasy of being a little girl. Yo. And essentially tells us to fuck with the people in the sim because he's bored. It seems the same offer was given to our dad, but he refused. So he's a dog now. We decide to follow through with the pranks and shenanigans. Braun absolutely loves this until he just decides to kill everyone. Use the knife to eliminate all the residents of Tranquility Lane. <laughs> Why not? It's just a prank, bro. <laughs> Personally, I don't really get what the big deal is. This is just your average Tuesday in Great Britain. No. <gasps> we do this and he allows us to leave. Once we get out of Tranquility Lane, we get some father and son time finally with dad. Before he says we need to head back to Rivet City to go find a, a gecko or something. You can choose to meet him at Rivet City and just fast travel there. I usually did this in my playthroughs. I never actually committed to walking with him, but you can. I thought it would be fun to have a little road trip with our father. Don't do it. No nothing happens. <laughs> There's no dialogue the entire journey. No talking whatsoever about why he was a dog what is he doing about jonas's death and that one i really wish we could discuss because like they play him as like a second dad like a cool uncle type character and yet after his death nothing he's never brought up at all it's just a straight shot to rivet city though it is fun to watch liam neeson take on everything with his fists what a legend once at rivet city he convinces dr lee to help him with his startup project again project purity this was an experiment to fix all the irradiated water and turn it back into fresh water in DC. Like the, the fountain of the waters of life. Just, just like the passage. You guys, I, I told you it was going to come back. We help him set this up at the Jefferson Memorial and we do get a little moment where he asks about some of the deeds we've done throughout our playthrough. I think we need to... I've been hearing things. Things that have happened out there. Megaton destroyed? You? Honestly, I have a hard time believing you. I raised you to be better than that. Better than the... We'll talk more about this later. There's too much work to be done now. The place gets raided by Enclave, who are like the opposite of the Brotherhood of Steel. They interrogate Dad and get him to hand over the project, but not before Dad decides to kill himself and tells us to run. Run. Run! Now, I'm going to be honest, jumping ahead a little bit here, this doesn't solve anything, really. <laughs> we could have just killed the colonel now. But no, dad had to go out. He had to die like a legend. Never did get that milk. We escaped to the Citadel and work with the Brotherhood of Steel to kind of mount a counterattack on the Enclave with the help of this giant robot. Cool. But not before we changed the plot of Fallout 4. <laughs> Anyway, first things first, we need to find that gecko. The Brotherhood of Steel tells us that the gecko is most likely at one of these vaults, specifically Vault 87. Now to gain access to this vault, we have to go through this YouTuber's wet dream of a settlement, a cave full of kids. <laughs> this is one of the cooler ideas for a settlement, but in reality is pretty boring. You see, this place is run by nothing but children, and once they get to a certain age, they're actually forced out into the wasteland day of my life it's time to go you know the rules the rules are stupid you're a mungo now you gotta leave maybe i can stay just a little longer bye sticky 
Yeah. Bye, Sticky. Don't just stand there. Get out of here already. Like I said, it's a cool idea, but it doesn't really go further than this, and it's kind of a boring place to explore. And it's buggy as hell. You're supposed to save some of the kids to gain access from Paradise Falls. Now, I've already been there and uh, cleaned up a little bit. Even though I saved the kids and told them to come back to Little Lamplight, they didn't show up. So I essentially got softlocked out of this area, which meant I couldn't play the game any further. So I ended up no clipping through the front gate, which kind of bugged with all of the dialogue options and also meant that I couldn't go through the back gate. <laughs> Just like real life. So anyway, no clipping through the whole of Little Lamplight. We're now at Vault 87 and we meet a super nice mutant called Forks or Bucks because we all know he fucks. <laughs> So it turns out the gecko we're searching for is in a severely radiated room, which we can't enter without, you know, becoming this guy. <laughs> Luckily, Fawkes says that he's more than happy to help us with this task because we freed him. So after following that super mutant booty for what didn't seem like long enough, to be honest, he gives us the gecko. Cheers, buddy. Hopefully I'll see you again. He'll be fine, though. He knows the way out. Maybe we'll meet again somewhere in the, the wasteland. Before leaving, the Enclave does kidnap us and takes our gecko. We have to fight through and blow this place up and Fox is here too, yay! Unfortunately, he's a nice girl and we're a bad boy, so we go our separate ways. There she goes! There she goes again! Alright, so now we should head back to the Brotherhood of Steel and give them the gecko. But we get a strange distress call from Vault 101. It seems things have gone a bit shit at Vault 101. So Amata's calling us back to try and help them out. We head back to the vault and we can see there's a bit of a rebellion going on. It seems the new overseer is just as crazy as the last overseer and Amata asks us to help her fix it. It doesn't really give us options here. So I just went for the more nostalgia route. Technically saving the vault, Amara is now, I guess, the new overseer. And now there's something about being the overseer for Vault 101. It makes you become an asshole. Amara thanks us, but then tells us we have to leave and never come back because we killed the last overseer. You saved us, but that doesn't change the fact that you killed the overseer in cold blood to do it. And I can't let that sort of thing stand here. I'm sorry. You're a hero and you have to leave. Well, first off, technically I've killed the last two. And you know what? I'm going to make it a third. <laughs> but that's it. The doors are closed and we can no longer go back into the vault. If we play things a bit differently, you can get Butch as a companion. But I mean, I'm well beyond needing a new slave, to be honest. On my way back to the Citadel, I do find this really cool oasis that is basically Kokori Forest. It seems a bit of a cult has formed here. And their god, the Great Deku Tree. But it turns out this is not some divine spirit. This is just a dude that got some fungus on his head, which eventually grew out to this. <laughs> he is in so much pain and he asks us to basically help him delete his character. Would you please kill me? To do this, we have to go through a cave with a bunch of murlocs and murloc kings to find his heart, which we can then either force to spread out the grass to save the wasteland, or we could just squeeze it. After doing that, we come back out. We see that the Great Deku Tree is dead, and the Cole's pretty chill about it. They allow me to leave. Don't worry. I hold no grudge towards you. Unfortunately, I don't return that kindness. <laughs> yep, definitely think I'm playing a bad character. We link up with the Brotherhood of Steel again, and we do a frontal assault on the Jefferson building. Honestly, consists of us just following the big robot as he does all the heavy lifting, but ah, it looks cool for the time. <laughs> we get to the purifier and we finally avenge our father. And we have a choice to make. Unfortunately, in all the commotion, the purifier starts going a bit haywire and someone has to go in and start the old go up. Unfortunately, this is a one way trip because the radiation is so high. So whoever goes in there is just going to do a dad. The game will literally call you a pussy if you don't commit suicide here. Just saying. It's a bit weird. 
I think they're going through a whole like uh, father like son. You both sacrificed each other to fulfill your mother's dream. Like it's beautiful. Unfortunately, I'm an asshole. So I send Sarah in. <laughs> Good luck. That's it. Fine. Thanks. Hey, we're all about equal rights in this household. See you later, Sarah. Thanks for taking the bullet. <laughs> your dad's going to be so angry at me. She does this and fresh water starts to flow in DC and it's a good ending until Ron Pellman calls me a dick in the end in slideshows. <laughs> and that's the end of Fallout 3. Ironically, we were the most evil person imaginable. But thanks to us and our daddy issues, we actually made the wasteland a better place and a safer place to live. And there's also room for a car park, so were we really the bad guy? What a game. And though the main story is not cooked at all, it's very bare bones. That's not why you play this franchise. It's mainly about the side content and all the different ways of life in the wasteland. But we're not quite done yet, because over a few months after the launch, Bethesda released expansions, one that actually continues the main story. So before I get into my thoughts of the game, let's dive into some DLC. The first one up is Broken Steel, which actually continued the main plot of the game. So let's take a look. So after you kill yourself or kill Sarah, the game will just redcon whatever just happened and bring you back to life. Sarah's dead though. Yeah, she doesn't get a second chance. <laughs> Owen's actually oddly chill about us making his daughter go into the chamber of death. He acts like she wouldn't have let us do it, but I, I can tell you she would have. So after waking up a month later, we are straight away tasked with destroying the last of the Enclave. As we head over to their main camp, we do suffer a loss. The big robot doesn't make it. Apparently the Enclave have some sort of satellite missile launcher thing. Why didn't they use this when we attacked the Purifier? What? Anyway, this is a perfect expansion if you're playing with energy weapons. You get so much ammo, you'll never need to buy more. Unfortunately, I didn't spec in energy weapons, so even when they gave me the overpowered Tesla cannon, it did less damage than my sniper rifle, so I just didn't use it. The biggest part of this DLC is that they raised the level cap from 20 up to 30. Unfortunately, this is the only DLC that does this, so you'll still most likely max out your character before you start the DLCs. But it's pretty cool. The fight on the main base is pretty tough. There's a lot of enemies. I would highly recommend if you have companions that can die, you send them home because they will just run out and fight anything and die. Next up on the DLC is Operation Anchorage. This is a simulation set back in the war between America and China in 2077. This one's fairly unique as it plays a little bit more like a boomer shooter rather than an RPG. The weapons that you find have to be given to you. You can't just loot them off dead corpses. Ammo and health are given to you by dispensers you find throughout levels rather than using your own supplies. It's pretty interesting. I decided to play completely without VATS to really get an authentic experience. And that authentic experience is clunky as hell. I forgot how much you need vats in this game. <laughs> this DLC is pretty short. You can do it in about 30 minutes. And it ends with you killing General Kingway. I think I pronounced that right. Or you could be like me and just convince him to do it himself. Because, I mean, why waste the bullet, right? Next up on the DLCs is Point Lookout, a swampland which is more of a new area to explore rather than just a story. Here we meet Desmond who is a ghoul fighting with a brain in a jar. Okay, <laughs> this is probably my favorite DLC. It feels more like an expansion to me. As much as I do like having an on rails story, having a big open world just to go explore again, granted it's a lot smaller than the wasteland. It's just nice to be able to explore more in Fallout 3. And apparently it takes a month to travel from DC to Point Lookout. So if you just keep going backwards and forwards, you can speed run your own death. Anyway, following the main quest, we meet up with some tribal members and then we get knocked out by a smelly tree. I I'm going to be honest, I don't know what's going on. We have a cool moment where we hallucinate and some random person I think is cutting our brain out. I only know this by the giant saw and <laughs> sewing, I guess. I also love the passive aggressive bubble heads. Anyway, we wake up and yes, it turns out we have had part of our brain removed. Thankfully, it's only the part that gives us common sense. So now we're an Overwatch 2 enjoyer. And now that that's done, let's go speak to Desmond and finish this quest. Next up is Mothership Zeta. 
or Zeta. I, I, I don't speak alien. I'm going to be honest, this one's a big dud for me. It's the one that in theory sounds the most interesting, being abducted by aliens and fighting on a big ship and having like unique weapons. It sounds cool. And look, I love having otherworldly objects stuck up my rectum as much as the next guy. But this is a snooze fest. The only interesting part to me was seeing the different abducted characters. You see a samurai, a cowboy, and a random dude that just got picked up before the nukes fell. And a dead spaceman. He's my favorite. This DLC is riddled with buggy minigames, buggy scenery, buggy NPCs. Is it just me or is this DLC the most bug ridden one of the lot? And look, I'm not calling the aliens bugs. Look, I'm not that sort of guy. Some of my best friends are bugs. I mean aliens. The DLC ends with a ship battle that I honestly don't know how this works. I just hit random buttons till I won. Oh man. Okay, lastly, it's The Pit. In this one, you take up the persona of, well, a slave. Ah, so this is how it feels. I should apologize to Clover. We need to sneak into the pit and find out about this cure for the people as this place is heavily radiated and turning the populace into... Well, Gollum. Look, not that I know how to run a slave camp or anything, but I feel like giving them all giant spinning blades of death as worker tools is a bad idea, right? I like this DLC. You have to restock on your own gear because you get completely clean slated at the start. It's nice having to really conserve ammo again. It's good fun. Though when I picked up one of the new weapons in the DLC, I got my first game crash. Honestly, I was expecting way more crashes in this game. So getting only one in my whole playthrough is pretty good. So when I reloaded, the weapon just refused to show up, but it was still there, so this seems a little bit OP. We find some ingots and we climb through the ranks of the pit and meet our fearless leader, but rather than kill him for revenge to free the slaves, we decide to steal his daughter, who luckily enough is actually the cure. I think I'm about to steal! I think we're supposed to have some sort of moral compass in this DLC, but like you either side with the slavers who are looking after this little girl, or you can steal the little girl give her to the slavers they don't seem to really care but you know they're not slaves anymore like what's the winning path here i don't ah <laughs> oh, no it it's kind of silly to be honest we watch the leader of the pit get devoured and the slaves are free look at them being free did anything change what did i accomplish here and that's all the dlc and that's the game so after all that, that's the end of Fallout 3, and I'm not gonna lie, I left the DLC to last for my playthrough, and I got burnt out playing through those, especially Mothership Zia. But the base game is still absolutely amazing. The main story beats can be very undercooked. Essentially, you spend most of the story looking for your dad just for him to die, and then you join the Brotherhood of Steel to fight the Enclave, and I mean, I don't even understand why we do this. They both have the same goals, the Lone Wanderer doesn't need to be part of this fight. He just gets dragged into it. The reason you go back to this game is to experience the settlements and to explore the wasteland. And honestly, that's why you play Fallout. I was at my most happiest when I was just walking around, zoning out, and just exploring rundown buildings. For me, that's what I loved about this game. And to this day, I still do. It's not something I would go back to every year to play. I I'd like a few years maybe even like a decade just so I can like forget a lot of the game before I dive back in. And that's exactly what I had this time around. I love Fallout 3. It's one of the few games that got me into RPG mechanics. As someone who was mainly into first person shooters as a kid, this opened up a whole new area of gaming for me and I hadn't played any of the Elder Scrolls games before this. So I went on to play those after and I mean you can guess what Oblivion and Skyrim was like to play for the first time. It does still feel clunky and the karma system still kind of just feels like you're choosing between a halo or a twirly mustache. It doesn't really build to anything but it's a solid title and one I don't think should get as much hate as it's getting now. Going by my memory of New Vegas, yeah, I do remember enjoying that game a lot more, but I never finished Fallout 4 because I found it more boring than Fallout 3. Now, maybe I'm wrong for that, and I haven't gone back to that game at all. Like, I know that had some DLC drop that I, I've never touched. So, hey, if you guys like this video and you want me to go into Fallout New Vegas and then Fallout 4, maybe I'll get to experience it. Maybe I'll get the same experience as I had with Batman and the Arkham games. The ones that I thought were better actually ended up being the worst. So it could be interesting to go back and check those out. Fallout 3 will always remind me of a time when Bethesda were just the pinnacle of gaming. 
They were a developer that had so much street cred and now they just, what are they doing? Fallout 4, they took a lot of hits with their core fans. And then Fallout 76 was a bit of a mess and I think it still is. I hear some people say it's worth trying now, but I mean, when I tried it, it was an absolute shit show. <laughs> and especially after Starfield dropped and just, I mean, even their modding community just left the game. I do hope that Bethesda will come back on top one day to like the status they had when they released Skyrim and maybe Elder Scrolls 6 will be that catalyst. Thank you so much for watching this video guys. I know it's a bit different jumping from the Batman games to Fallout but I thought with the TV show coming out it could be a decent talking point point. and of course I wasn't able to talk about all the side quests in this game because the video would go on forever and man I don't even want to hear my voice for that long so I really don't think you do. <laughs> But um, just so we can keep the conversation flowing in the comments section, let me know what your favorite side quest is in Fallout 3 and let me know why. I try to respond to every comment I get on my videos. To be honest, it is mainly when I'm pooping. So if you see a response from me, I'm probably pooping. Just to give you a little peek behind the curtain there. <laughs> Generally, I know these videos are very opinion based from my perspective because I mean, I'm making the video. But I do love to hear your guys' takes and kind of see if they mesh with mine or if I'm in the minority. I love it. It's honestly the best part of making these videos. A big shout out to Pitstab over on Patreon. You have been supporting me since you found the channel. Thank you so much. I do try to post little hints and exclusive content on Patreon. So if any of you guys want to support the channel with a bit of cash, that is the best way to do it. I'll leave a link on the screen. I give a shout out to anyone who joins. So yeah. That would be greatly appreciated. But this has been a long video. I am going to go get some food. Have a good one, guys. I'll see you in the next video. But until then, please stay safe and have a good one. Tie out.